at the Site C Summit in Victoria, British Columbia. It's Saturday, January the 27th, 2018. I'm talking to Sarah Cox, who's written a book called Breaching the Peace, and I think you just said it's in the typesetting phase now. Yes, it'll be available uh, May 1st. It's already available on Amazon to, to pre-order. Okay, great. Um, what's the book about and why did you write it? Um, the book is about uh, the Peace River Valley and it is, um, oh, I could zoom in to the, to the title there. Uh, the book is about the Peace River Valley. I went to the Peace River Valley for the first time just five years ago. And uh, I'm, I've been, lived in BC since I was a teenager and I had never been to Northeast BC, like a lot of people in the province. And uh, literally my first sight of the valley, I, on scenic grounds alone, it was hard to believe that we were going to flood this place. And I think that a big issue with uh, the Site C campaign has been that Site C is out of sight and out of mind. The name does not, Site C does not evoke something that you might want to protect. I knew very little about the valley when I first went there and I met everybody from Chief Roland Wilson uh, of the West Moberly First Nations to Ken and Arlene Boone, who have been at the forefront of the fight by uh, the landowners, the 70 landowners who will lose homes and property to Site C. I met and spoke to all of those people and I became firmly convinced that this project was not in the public interest of British Columbians. And so I set about to tell the story of the project and to try to bridge that divide between uh, Southern British Columbia and Northern British Columbia. And I think what we need to remember is that there are already two dams on the Peace River, uh, two dams that flooded uh, a very important part of the traditional territory of Treaty 8 First Nations, and that Site C uh, would flood basically the last remaining section of a valley that is precious in many, many ways uh, to First Nations and to everybody else who lives in the valley and who visits the valley. Now, you said it's not in the, in the interest of the people of British Columbia, in your opinion, and in my opinion also, and yet the provincial government, the NDP, who campaigned, I, I think we can say they campaigned against it for a long, long time, uh, decided to go ahead with it. Um, how is it not in the interests of, of the government of BC, and why do you think they, of the people of BC, and why do you think they decided to approve it? Um, yeah, the, the NDP campaigned uh, on a platform of sending Site C to the BC Utilities Commission for review. Uh, the BC Utilities Commission is a watchdog commission. It basically determines whether large energy projects are in the public interest. And the previous Liberal government changed the law to exempt Site C from review by the BCUC. So the NDP committed to send Site C to review. Uh, last time around that the BCUC reviewed Site C in the 80s, uh, they concluded that the energy was not needed in the time frame, that it would be very destructive, and uh, basically directed BC Hydro to look at alternatives for future energy supply, such as geothermal. So that was, uh, the BCUC was exempt from looking at this project to determine if it was in the public interest, and the NDP pledged to send it to the uh, Utilities Commission for review. In the 80s, when they reviewed it, they spent two years reviewing it with public hearings, testimony under oath to get to that conclusion. This time around, it was a three-month fast-track review focusing only on certain aspects. And when that review came back, it showed that the project could reach $12.5 billion in costs, that it was likely falling behind schedule, and pointed to the fact that there are alternatives which were at least as expensive, if not cheaper, than Site C for meeting future energy needs. And I think at that point many people thought, okay, it, the project is going to be cancelled. So it was quite a surprise when the NDP announced that they were going to proceed with it in December. Financially, what are the impacts going to be on, we'll say ratepayers, but that's basically everybody in the province. So Mark Ellison, who is the former CEO of BC Hydro, has said that Site C could cause our hydro rates to rise by 40%. Uh, that's on top of already scheduled rate increases of 25% over five years. 
If you look at what has happened in other provinces where they have proceeded with very expensive, outdated energy infrastructure, uh, large dams, the Muskrat Falls Dam in Newfoundland, the Kias Dam in Manitoba, both of those projects further along than Site C have gone hugely over budget. Muskrat Falls started at $6 billion, like Site C, and is now up to $12.7 billion. Site C has gone from a $6.6 .6 billion project in 2010 to a $10.7 billion project today, only two years into construction. And what has happened in those provinces is that hydro rates have gone up hugely. In Newfoundland and Labrador, the average household is going to have an $1,800 an annual increase on their hydro bills as a result of Muskrat Falls. In Manitoba, the actual increase is not yet known, but it's going to be in the double digits. And that's what's awaiting BC. The thing is, it's not going to hit the books until 2024. So we're not going to be paying for it on our hydro bills right now, but we will begin to pay for it on our hydro bills if and when it becomes operational. And that will squeeze my daughter's generation much more than they're already being squeezed. And I'm assuming that's the plan. Can you just repeat the number you said about Muskrat Falls? Muskrat Falls started as a six billion dollar project and it will produce less energy than Site C and it is now at 12.7 billion dollars. The CEO of the provincial energy company has said that it is a boondoggle, that it should never have been started. Similar statements have been um, mentioned by Manitoba Hydro as well, that the Kiosk Dam should never have been started. In the case of both of those dams, as with Site C, the energy is not needed provincially. It will be sold at a loss. And yet, in spite of all that, the John Horton government decided to go ahead with it, which is very interesting. They did indeed. Um, can you talk a little bit about the people in the south and the people in the north? and? Uh, the different ways maybe we look at it, but really we all have the same interests, which is a good province and jobs and prosperity or good communities. For sure. So, and, and I think this is the issue with Site C is it's very out of sight and out of mind. It takes, if you're driving from Vancouver, it takes 14 hours to get there. It takes as long to get to the Saskatchewan border as it does to get up there. Very few British Columbians have been up there. So, and there has been very little um, mainstream media scrutiny on the dam. The local media have covered it, but there's been very little when you consider that it's the largest publicly funded project in BC's history. So here we are in southern BC, there's something going on way out of sight, way out of mind. It's hard for people to care. It's hard for them to care about something called Site C. It used to be called the Site C Dam on the Peace River or the Peace River Dam. The Peace River has been dropped. Now it's just called Site C. I think a lot of people still don't know about it. They still don't know about the people who will be affected. They still don't know about the agricultural land that will be affected. They still don't know about the biodiversity that will be affected. And all this ostensibly to create jobs. Christy Clark, and here's where we get into some of the misinformation that's gone on about this project. Christy Clark, when she announced that Site C would proceed, said there would be 10,000 jobs in construction. Well, the WAC Bennett Dam created 3,500 jobs in construction in the 60s. And in the 90s, when Site C was proposed for a second time and rejected for a second time, BC Hydro said it would create just over 2,000 jobs. So how we get to 10,000 jobs is very hard to believe. And we need to contrast that when, with the number of jobs that will exist if it is completed, which is 25 jobs. We need to contrast that with provinces like Ontario, where 5,000 jobs have been created in solar and they're not going away. Geothermal has the potential to create 1,900 jobs that are not going away in this province as well. So when we talk about jobs, we're talking about short-term jobs. We're talking about jobs in one region of the province instead of spreading it around the province as we would if we invested in wind and solar and geothermal. And of course conservation, which is another big part of the... It is, and, and I, I think also that people don't realize that uh, the Peace River Valley is a very special place for biodiversity. It's where four eco-regions meet. It has incredible biodiversity. It's a low elevation valley for the north. It has things like cacti grow there. 
Um, it's the most northerly point in the world where cacti grow, the prickly pear cacti grows there. It has beautiful, magnificent, old growth boreal forest that will be cut down for Site C. It has dozens and dozens and dozens of species that are vulnerable to extinction. It's a, a flyway for migratory birds, a continentally important flyway for migratory birds, and uh, very important in terms of biodiversity. Um, we talk about wanting to protect biodiversity. One of the themes that's come up at this um, summit is the fact that there's already been tons of development in the north. It's as though we've unofficially designated BC's northeast as an industrial sacrifice zone, and Site C just would seal the deal on that. There's tons of development up there. It's been very harmful to biodiversity. You've heard from First Nations how it's affected their ability to practice their traditional practices that were guaranteed to them in Treaty 8. Moose are disappearing. Caribou have all but disappeared from the landscape. The fish have been poisoned. Site C will just exacerbate that harm. And uh, scholars across Canada looked at Site C and they examined it compared to other industrial projects and they found that it would have more environmental effects than any project ever examined in the history of Canada's Environmental Assessment Act. They gave it a 20 serious environmental impact effects rating just to compare the Enbridge pipeline got one. Just if you can just repeat that the most negative environmental impacts of any project ever studied in the history of Canada's Environmental Assessment Act that came out that was a report led by UBC but it was signed on to by uh, scholars across Canada and backed by the Royal Society of Canada. Maybe last question, uh, disinformation and I, I'd like to focus on the media because there are so many issues around Site C where people have been either misinformed about the truth, for example we're told it's clean and green when neither of those is true, the, the the greenhouse gas impact of Site C is going to be massive, for example. Um, and also, like when, when families are being forced off the land, it's as if the media absolutely refuses to make it an issue, so the public does not get involved, as we should, over what is being done by both Christy Clark and John Horgan to so many people for no reason. Do you want to just comment on, on the media and, and information? Sure. Just in terms of the media, I think we have a very different media landscape than we had 5, 10, or 20 years ago. Um, 10,000 journalists in Canada have lost their jobs since 2008. We have a changing media landscape. Very few journalists have actually been up to the piece. Newsrooms have very few resources now. They don't. Reporters don't have time. To, to dig into uh, things like Site C, to question announcements, to question the spin that's been put forward um, by the government in BC Hydro about the project. And um, I think that uh, increasingly the, the new media, the independent media, have led the way on Site C coverage. I write for one of those outlets, Desmog Canada, and uh, that that is where the information is, is coming from. Most of the information is coming from in terms of the impacts in terms of the First Nations impacts, in terms of the court cases launched by First Nations to try to stop the project, in terms of the impacts on 70 people in the Peace River Valley who will lose homes and property to this project. Do you have any ideas how to make desmog and other alternative, I don't know what word to use, other independent, independent media? more prominent so that more people can get your messages, the messages. We're, we're trying and uh, every single independent media organization relies on readers. We rely on monthly donors and uh, we are reader funded and uh, we just encourage people to uh, check us out and uh, share with your friends and if you can to become a monthly donor. Sarah Hawks, thank you very much. Thank you.